My name is Neil Carey, and I represent the charity Autism Butts. We're joined by one of our members, Kendra. Kendra, who has agreed to talk to us about her experiences of living with autism. So, Kendra, thank you very much for joining us. My first question to you is this. Before you were ever diagnosed, what made you think you may be autistic? Uh, I scored very highly in the online tests and I was having a lot of problems in the workplace. Um, I became burdened with other people's work and it just sort of made me crash out all the time. And I was finding myself having to leave the office all the time um, and have, trying to find places to go and shut down, which was very difficult for me um, because um, I wasn't used to having all these problems um, until I did this job where it was just overwhelming for me. Um, and then eventually it was at a point where like I put two and two together and it was like, well, I've scored highly in this. I'm having all these problems. I've been having these problems for some time now, not all the shutdowns, but I've certainly been having the social communication and like the sort of like the problems where I don't really want to talk to anyone because I get a lot of anxiety. And so I thought, you know, it's best I'll just write all this down and take it to my GP um, and then see where it goes from there, really. So that leads on to my next question, which is, how did you go about getting diagnosed? I wrote down a whole pile of stuff about myself and what I had to go through. Um, and also I got a lot of medical records from subject access requests from the hospital where I was treated for epilepsy as a child. And there was a lot of information on there about my behavioral problems, the fact that I wasn't paying any attention to anybody that was talking to me um the, the the doctor the consultant um pediatrician at the time said that they were going to refer me on to what was called child guidance back in 1982 mm -hmm. and um this was a long time before calms ever existed um and then um i sort of stopped there with the medical records that i'd been referred to this child guidance place but then i thought to myself you know maybe i could find out a bit more about this place and what they did um, so I actually went out of my way to see if I could find out a bit more about it. Um, and it turns out it wasn't actually an NHS institute at all. It was actually run by the education department back then because I think it was assumed that the, the like autistic children and children with behavioural problems needed education. That was the only way to stop them from having the terrible behaviours. So I think that's why it was linked together back then. Um, it wasn't recognised that actually a medical condition needs medical expertise like so much. Um, so anyway, I looked into it. I actually went all the way to Reading to find some information about the, the building. Um, and just to make sure that the building that I thought I was going to as a child was the same building. And it turns out it was the same building, only it was no longer like um, a child guidance centre because they all got shut down when calms came into place. Um, it turned out that it turned into actually turned into an adult autistic centre. So um, yeah, so they took, I think the council had sort of moved on, sort of moved it on. All the phone numbers were the same for what it was, um, and then eventually they just, I think eventually the council sold the building off, and then it was taken over by somebody else that wasn't related to um, behavioural problems at all. Um, so that was quite useful to know that I wasn't going mad. I did actually don't remember going to that building as a child and um, I did have that experience as a child. So there was that background as well. And when I went to my autism assessment, I showed them that I'd gone to the trouble of going all the way to this medical records library. Um, well, sort of like it was a letter, not medical, it was like a yellow pages library um to find out where this building was and what the phone number was and like if it was definitely the same one that I I went to when I was a kid um but that that's where it ended really because once I found out it was from the Department of Education um I tried to contact them but they said they got rid of all their records like a long time ago I think it was like 2002 that my record would have been wiped so I have no idea what the outcome was of that, ex that experience, to be fair. I mean, my mother would have known because she was there, but she died when I was 16, so I can't ask her either. So nobody really knows what happened in that clinic. Mm. But I'm assuming they, I mean, I think from what I remember, because I was a child and because I do have, I am autistic, let's face it, I am autistic. 
I could hear exactly what they were saying, even though they made me play with toys in the corner. And they were saying, you know, what we see a lot of this behaviour and people that have Asperger's, but it's always boys that have it. So we can't really diagnose Kendra. We just have to see how she gets on, you know, growing up. So, you know, obviously I had to deal with it by myself for all these years. Kendra, wow. And can I ask, how did, when you actually knew that you were autistic, how did you feel about your diagnosis? I was happy that I was diagnosed and I was happy that I could then go away and read more about it because like while I was living in this limbo for all these years not realizing that I was autistic and I had all these problems that were because I was autistic I am autistic and I've always been autistic even back in 1982 which they should have like looked into but they didn't um while I was going through that, um, I sort of like realised that, you know what, this is why, this is what's wrong with me, because you hear the word autism and you don't know what it is unless you've lived with it or or like you've lived with somebody that's got like that is autistic. Um, so you don't understand that what you're going through is autism. I used to think I was just a strange personality uh, and that, uh, you know, like most people didn't like me because I was a strange personality. But now I know that my personality is because of the autism. It's not because I'm like, I'm just a weirdo. I've actually got a condition and there's nothing can do about it because it's, there's no cure for it. I, I just have to live with it and manage it as best as I can. I understand. So, so Kendra, how does autism affect the way that you do your job? Well, it's quite hard unless there's a, like few people. So like when there's people on holiday or when there's people like who have been off sick or something, then it's easier for me to actually do my job. I mean, it's very surprising. People get very surprised that I find it easier when there's hardly anyone in the office because they think, oh my gosh, she's got so much work to do. She's by herself. But the, the peace and quiet is just, that, that it's priceless. It's priceless because when there's like eight people that work in my office, and when they're all there, I can't do work for more than half an hour before I have to leave because my brain just gets overcrowded with the noise. Wow. Uh, Kendra, what reasonable adjustments have been made in your workplace to help you? Okay, so I I, I have said, I did state at the beginning that I need like visual aids because I don't remember anything. There's far too much information going around and I can't retain all of it all at once, like in a short space of time. So I did ask them if I could have my telephone numbers that I need to ring other people in the hospital on them all. Um, so I've got a wall full of telephone numbers for various teams, like teams that I'm communicating, not just my own team, but other teams that I need to communicate with. Um, I had to go for access to work to get um, a funding to get earplugs. But even like the earplugs help a little bit, but they don't help 100% mm. uh, because I still hear people talking around me. And even though it's dim, it's still right chaotic noise in my head, even though it's quiet. So I don't actually like chaotic noise in my head. I like to have one voice. Um, so one to one is much better for me or like just a small group of people who take turns is fine. But when you've got lots of people and they're all having different conversations, I just can't cope. Mm. So, um, yeah, again, I still walk out if I get too tired at work, which they've allowed me to do because of my disability. Um, and like. Um, if there is like a Wednesday it's got really bad now because they've invited another team over from a different branch of the hospital um, so they all talk about their own stuff that other team in my office and my team talk about their stuff and there's too many voices on top of each other so that's why I haven't been to autism bucks for such a long time like to the, the online meetings or even in person because my brain just can't cope after that on Wednesdays um, so um, the reason just this, I just don't need to keep leaving but still I still get tired even though I've got all these reasonable adjustments, it's quite difficult. So, so Kendra, I guess you partially answered my next question, which is how much does autism impact your social life? I've never really had one. I've always hidden away because I never understood why nobody liked me. So it was really difficult. I can't really talk to people that I've never met before. I find it really hard unless I've actually got purpose to talk to them. Unless I've scripted it in advance or there's a definite reason, like I'm going in a shop, I can't find something on a shelf, then I have to speak to somebody and say, look, do you know where this thing is? But then I would have a reason to talk to them. I can't just walk up to people like you do at a party and start chit-chatting about random nonsense because for me that is a waste of my, my spoon, so to speak. Yeah. You know, I will burn out very quickly. Unless there's a purpose of conversation, I'd rather not have it. 
So um, generally speaking, I don't really, I haven't really made any friends since I would say I haven't made any friends. Well, not friends, like neurotypical friends. I haven't made any of them probably since about, I don't know, 1996. Um, really? Because um, the only friends I've got are ones that I met before 1996, who were a bit more open-minded, sort of liberal type people that would accept that there is slight differences in the way I communicate. Um, but they don't hold it against me um, and they stayed in touch with me all that time and people I've wet through, met, met, wet, sorry, met through my workplaces but both of those people happen to be neurodivergent mm. so that's probably we've got and one of them's got an autistic brother who saw straight away that I was just like her brother even before my diagnosis she said you know Kendra you're just like my brother William I'm like but I'm not like William you're like William um <laughs> yeah um, Kendra, so uh, alongside the sort of social life, what and, and I know you've mentioned some of these already, but what are the biggest challenges you face in your day-to-day -day living as a result of your diagnosis? Um, well, my day-to-day -day living is mainly managing my time. I'm finding it quite hard at the moment um, to manage my time uh, because it, it's all related to how, how much energy I've got left in order to manage that in order to plan things I have to have energy and if I don't have energy I can't plan things and sometimes I just do things like with this this online meeting I said nine o'clock not thinking oh, I've already booked something so I can't make it at nine o'clock mm. you know it was only afterwards I realized or like with that my friend who can't see properly like you invited that friend to come to the farm whatever farm it was and like I said yeah I'll ask her but then I realized I can't because we're doing something else you know this keeps happening to me all the time and last week I had a meeting at another hospital to go to but I'd already arranged to meet somebody to talk about autism mm. uh, but I completely forgot and she's like email me Kendra where are you I've been in a cafe for 20 minutes I'm like don't even remember what day it was I booked you in you know so this is how it affects me it's mostly I just can't remember anything anymore um you know I have to look over things three or four times just to see if I'm doing the right thing or not you know I can't just do it once and then remember sure okay and and Kendra um, my last question to you is what advice would you give to someone who's just been diagnosed as autistic um meet other people who are autistic um, because they probably have quite similar experiences to yourself. They won't expect any sort of strange, nuanced language that you don't understand. Uh, they won't mind if you tell them straight what's what. Um, they won't take offence at all. Or they won't think that you're like, sort of like you don't have any empathy towards them or you don't care about their feelings because they understand that you don't feel the same way as them, probably. Or even if you do, you're not going to show it because you're autistic. So, I mean, yeah, I think it's better to do that. And if you do meet people that aren't autistic, just make sure that they understand autism, because if they don't, you aren't going to get on with them very well. And you're just going to end up in a mental health counselling service again. Brilliant. Kendra, thank you so much for taking the time to share this with us. Uh, it, it's been an honour to listen to your story. Thank you.